<clears throat> Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome. I'm Jen Schwartz, a humanities and social sciences librarian at DePaul University Library. We are a co-sponsor, along with Moraine Valley, our hosts, of this 15th annual Information Literacy Summit. I am so very excited to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, Emily Drabinsky. Emily is Associate Professor and Coordinator of Library Instruction at Long Island University, Brooklyn, and she has written extensively about critical librarianship, gender and sexuality in librarianship, and the intersections of composition studies and the library. She is the co-editor of Critical Library Instruction, Theories and Methods, and she sits on the board of Radical Teacher, a journal of feminist, socialist, and anti-racist teaching practice. She also edits the book series Gender and Sexuality in Information Studies for uh, Library Juice Press. And today, Emily is going to be speaking with us about critical librarianship. Just a little bit of information about critical librarianship, if you're not already very familiar with the topic. Um, librarians who practice critical librarianship strive to communicate the ways in which libraries and librarians consciously and unconsciously support systems of oppression. It seeks to be transformative, empowering, and a direct challenge to power and privilege. And in academic libraries, critical librarianship can support critical thinking, information literacy, and lifelong learning skills in students. Her presentation today is called, as you can see, Critical Pedagogy in a Time of Compliance. So let's please welcome Emily. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jennifer. How do I sound? Am I loud enough? Okay. Um, I'm a little nervous up here, but I want to thank you so much for inviting me. Especially thank you to Tish Hayes and Troy Swanson for the invitation to join you in Illinois, a state I haven't been to. I think I've been here twice, so I'm glad to be here again. I know how difficult it is to organize events like this one, and I want to acknowledge the work that it takes to bring a group like us together to talk about libraries for a day. I organized something like this in Vancouver last weekend, and I just want to say in advance that I'm very satisfied with the coffee and the amount of refreshments and the lunch is terrific. Um, <laughs> so thank you. I'm looking forward to the breakout sessions this morning and afternoon. Also, hello to anyone watching this via live stream. I love the internet. I know how much work and expense is involved in live streaming, and I'm glad this talk has been made accessible to people outside in the land of computers. Eamon, if you are watching, thank you for feeding my cats. So I'm glad all of you could join us today. The title of today's talk, which is on this giant PowerPoint slide, and that one as well, uh, came to me in a dream. No, really, I had been given this platform by Tish and Troy and invited to talk about what interests me. That's actually a pretty tall order and pretty intimidating when you're not so sure you have more to say than anyone else. So I decided to avoid thinking about it. I decided I would think about anything else but that, pretend the talk wasn't happening. But unfortunately, I have a subconscious that is not all that interesting, and it mostly works through the day-to-day practical concerns as I sleep. I will have dreams about walking down the hallway at work. So the gift my subconscious gave me this time was this title, Critical Pedagogy in a Time of Compliance. I woke up thrilled about it. This is some provocative stuff, and I rushed to share the good news with my friends and family. I had really hit on something fantastic, right? Compliance, they said. Is there some other word you can use? <laughs> I'm not sure anyone is interested in compliance. But I think what my friends and family who don't work in libraries were missing was the intensity I feel of living inside this mix of being alive to the transformative potential of the kinds of critical teaching and learning that have recently come center stage in information literacy work that Jennifer talked about in her introduction. And what can sometimes feel like the deadening demand to reduce that critical work to what can be counted and reported to administrators who then further crunch the numbers for iPads and accreditation so that we can provide evidence of our value and proof that we're complying with various standards. Maybe I am the only librarian facing that compliance pressure, but somehow I don't think so. <laughs> as we saw during what I'll call the great framework debate, even as many of us embraced the framework for information literacy, uh, in part because of its frank and direct engagement with critical perspectives in the field, we also bridled at the absence of clear directions to help us produce the data that meets our data gathering requirements. The framework's perspective on assessment, one that I think fits hand in glove with critical pedagogy, emphasizes the importance of local contextual learning outcomes that are measured with tools that make local contextual sense. 
This is aligned with critical pedagogy for sure. But in asking us to do assessment work that makes local sense, the framework, somewhat paradoxically, requires all of us to do a lot more assessment work. Part of what many of us appreciate about the standards is the gift of outcomes and indicators that we did not need to invent for ourselves. They're in many ways easy to understand and explain. They're pretty easy to measure and evaluate. And the time we save developing local assessment tools could be spent doing something else, which for many of us has included designing and deploying critical pedagogies in our classrooms. So I worked from the title of my dreamscape to the next 40 minutes or so, and I'm sorry to report that I don't have a recipe for doing critical pedagogy in a time of compliance. I've never been great at answers, <laughs> what's unfortunate. But I do hope this talk will open up some ways of thinking with each other today and beyond about how to be critical teaching librarians in these interesting times. So, a time of compliance. I have like four slides, you know? <laughs> like it just, it turns out I see the world in Times New Roman 12 point type. Um, this is a little bigger than that, but this is like my big visual. So I hope you're enjoying it. Um, so I'd like to start by talking a little bit about what I mean when I say a time of compliance. When I say time, I mean something other than 9.37 a.m. or Friday morning or April 29th. When I'm talking about time here, I mean kairos, a Greek idea of qualitative time that marries social, political, and historical context to a sense of the present. We can contrast kairos with chronos, which is clock time in an ordinary sense, to help make the word more meaningful. So if it's five o'clock in chronos time, it's quitting hour or happy hour in kairos time. I think it's always useful to ask ourselves, what time is it in a broad way? It's a way of apprehending the present itself as constructed by social and political forces, by a series of decisions and actions that could have been different and could have produced a different kind of world. My girlfriend is a historian and here today in a kind of magical like spring break accident. Um, and it's been very useful to me to watch the way she makes meaning out of the past. She looks at laws, memos, letters, and other kinds of documents in, in order to understand why the world was the way it was in, say, Detroit in the 1920s. But if you lived in Detroit in the 1920s, you would likely understand yourself the way we understand ourselves, as living in a time and place that simply is what it is, natural, a world that fundamentally happens to be the way it is. But the present is really just on its way to being past when it will be subject to the kind of political, social, and economic analysis that historians do. I think the idea of Kairos, for me, helps us to articulate the present with that kind of context. And I think this context can help explain why we are faced with the kinds of choices we make. On a small scale, Kairos demands that we choose between a glass of beer, a glass of wine, a seltzer, but on the scale I'm interested in today, Kairos helps us understand why we're designing certain kinds of testing instruments to evaluate learning, rather than walking our students to a card catalog and helping them look up a book by author. There are, of course, many stories we could tell about the present, but the one I see every day is a present in higher education that demands more and more production of data, measuring everything from the number of seats available for students in our library to the extent to which graduating seniors are able to articulate their research questions and how that has changed over time. I think these calls for data production are inextricably linked to demands for compliance. In some cases, this can take really explicit form. In my university, adherence to learning outcomes assessment protocols is mandatory in order to request funding for new faculty positions in any department. The university makes these assessment reports mandatory because of compliance requirements from our accrediting body. Ours is called Middle States, and the systematic reporting of student learning outcomes is embedded in more than one standard, all of which must be met if we want to secure accreditation. Middle States is demanding this evidence in order to remain compliant with federal government directives about accountability. And without accreditation, we can't accept federal funding in the form of grants or critically student loans. And as a tuition-dependent university, accreditation means survival. I try to remember this when I'm compiling feedback from my colleagues in between sessions at an information literacy summit in Illinois on a series of test questions linked to the information literacy standards so that we can have a uniform test bank available for validity testing as soon as the semester ends on May 12th. Right? It's super concrete. And it's important, right? I mean, I, I like bridle at it and I don't want to do it at all, but I see that, you know, I love my job 
and I like paying my rent and having a dinner later and you know I had a glass of wine with dinner last night and it was like not a big deal I could pay for it and that that all at the end of the day is linked to my ability to incorporate feedback that was all sent hitting reply all you know do you know what I mean anyway uh, so our professional body I think has responded to this assessment regime that starts with the federal government and ends at my desk a regime that I'm calling today a kairos of compliance by producing any number of toolkits, publications, roundtables, journals, conferences, reports, workshops, and webinars to help us meet our data generation and compliance needs. Just this week, the Value of Academic Libraries Project released a report that proclaimed the discovery of compelling evidence that the library plays a significant role in student learning outcomes, retention, and graduation rates. While I saw plenty of grousing online, on Twitter, and on listservs about the methods that produce the data, there's something about correlation and causation that I didn't know when I was in library school that I would have to understand. I imagine that I was not alone in greeting the headline with real cheer. My governing body has made my argument for me. So I'd like us to think about these toolkits, roundtables, journals, conferences, reports, workshops, and webinars as historical artifacts, even though they appear in our present. Remember that our present is always receding. It's about to be history. So rather than understanding them as the culmination of truth-telling devices, as proof of something that we all know is true because we see it every day, right? That libraries play a role in student learning. Like, like, do I need a report about that? Like, you could just ask that student, you know, who is going to graduate because she's able to, you know, you know what I mean? Like, you feel it. Um, now I've lost my place. <laughs> but I think these artifacts tell us something about the Kairos, these artifacts that our professional body produces. They emerge from a context that demands data and compliance, and to the extent to which they corroborate the value and meaning of those chirotic demands, they help produce a future where data will be the currency of teaching and learning. There are, of course, other ways of measuring learning, right? Like when I learn something, it usually takes a while. Like I remember when I realized that reading Plato in college was useful, and it was about 15 years later, <laughs> right? Uh, and it has something to do with feelings. But we live in a time of compliance, one where all things must be measured. And as we dutifully validate our data, I'd like to suggest that we be mindful of the Kairos that is producing us and our interest in these concerns, and that we are reproducing as we go. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about critical ped pedagogy and what I see. This is my third slide. <laughs> It has bullet points. Um, if we are living and working in a time of compliance, I think that's only one part of the story. We are also living in a time of critical engagement with and resistance to assessment regimes. I think we can see many signs that critical perspectives play a central role in our present, like I'm here, right? And 10 years ago when I was saying the same things, no one was really interested in what I had to say. So the fact that I'm here, I think, is a, is a sign. Um, so I'm giving this keynote. Maria T. Accardi is in Minnesota this morning giving a keynote about critical pedagogy. Kevin Sieber and Jessica Critton are talking about critical pedagogy in California later today because of time zones. Uh, I see names like Chris Borg and Sophia Noble routinely on conference stages, and those conference stages increasingly have themes about social justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. This academic year alone has seen conferences on diversity at Rutgers, critical pedagogy at the University of Arizona, and gender and sexuality at Simon Fraser, which that was, that was my conference, and I'm really glad it's over. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, yeah, because you can't get enough coffee. There's like not enough coffee in the world. <laughs> there just isn't. I don't know. It's like magic. Anyway, the uh, CritLib hashtag gets circulated on Twitter all the time, and sometimes it feels like critical theory and pedagogy are on trend in the profession and in the work we do every day. And I think critical pedagogy has been one of the central ways the practicing librarians have articulated that critical perspective. When Alana Kambir, Maria Tia Cardi, and I began editing critical library instruction theories and methods in 2008, we received about 30 chapter submissions. Kelly McElroy and Nicole Pigowski set out to edit a similar volume last year and received, I think, close to 100 for what has turned into a two volume set. That means that in less than a decade, critical pedagogy has moved from the margins to the center of information literacy, pedagogy, and practice. It's one of the most exciting and surprising shifts in my time as a librarian. I'm not one for much for origin stories since I think knowledge comes from so many people, places, and things. So I just want to frame out four aspects of critical pedagogy, you see them on these bullet points, uh, that I see at the heart of this movement in libraries. So one, advocates of critical pedagogy believe that teaching and learning can help make the world a better place. 
For many of us, an interest in social justice and equality lies at the heart of what we do. We don't want to simply help students pass their research writing classes, although we want that too, but we hope for something larger. We want to transform the perspectives of students in our classrooms so that they can, for example, see racism and sexism at play and feel themselves empowered as agents of social change who can intervene in those isms for good. My colleagues Susan Thomas and Kate Angel teach social work classes using zines to help students see that important ways of knowing are created outside the academy, and their voices matter too. Maria Accardi and others consistently use feminist and anti-racist examples in classrooms, tapping the librarian's access to feminist collections to help students imagine a different kind of world. Two, second bullet point. Advocates for critical pedagogy treat everyone as someone who knows something which means less lecturing, which I'm doing today, um, and more active engagement with students in our classrooms and at the reference desk. Critical pedagogy is opposed to banking education, a concept from Paolo Freire. I don't know how you say his name. Is that right, Freire? A radical Brazilian educator. Banking education is the idea that teachers, people who know things, can deposit knowledge inside the heads of people who don't know things. We can call these people students that can later be withdrawn from them in the same form, much as one can deposit a check at the bank and then withdraw cash later. Lectures followed by multiple choice tests are an example of banking education. I also think a reference interaction where a student asks a question and a librarian simply provides an answer without dialogue is an example of banking education. Banking appears wherever we see the fantasy that teaching and learning is about me telling you something that you don't know but then you know because I told you. So in a critical library classroom, students work in small groups, they pair and share, they take control of the mouse and the keyboard. <coughs> Three, critical pedagogy marries theory to practice. It's about praxis. What we think about things is always structuring what and how we do things, even if we're not aware of it. I think critical teachers are explicit about their engagement with theories and ideologies, including Marxism, queer theory, critical race theory, and others. Queer theory structures a lot of what I do in the classroom, for example. I think everything is socially constructed and subject to change, and this influences my teaching when I introduce the linguistic structures of the library catalog as systems of power that we all have to learn to negotiate and resist. I think when teachers suggest that theory has no place in the classroom, that they are just teaching, what I hear is that their work is informed by dominant ideologies that, by virtue of being dominant, are very hard to see. They are the water the fish are swimming in. David James Hudson has argued that this division between theory and practice is a false one, that thinking is itself a kind of practice and that practice is a kind of theory making. And I find this art line of argument quite compelling, but I also think the division, even if it's not real, is useful for surfacing the value of theoretical work, which I think tends to get lost as we go to work every day. That's another talk, but I did want to mark it as a point of contention and maybe, maybe we'll give that talk next week, I don't know. Four. A fourth thing that I see at work in critical pedagogy is an opposition to the mechanization of teaching and learning that emerges as part of what Lisa Slonyowski has called audit culture and that I am conceptualizing today as a time of compliance. Critiquing standards or the professional and intellectual structures that govern teaching practice in libraries has been at the core of critical pedagogy discussions. As Lisa Hinchliff and others have argued, the problems with standards are often not problems with the content of the standards themselves. Like I do want students to be able to articulate their thesis, right? Who wouldn't want that? Um, but the problem is in their application in a given context. It's not necessarily a problem to articulate what we want students to learn, know, do, and be, but it's the linking of those definitions with power and the way that power linked with standards tends to foreclose other possibilities that lie outside the standards that I think is the problem. So now I'd like to take a few minutes to unpack that claim. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the standards and then a little bit about the framework. And I, when I was writing this, I was like, oh, I hope we're not tired of talking about the standards and tired of talking about the framework. But I think there's something really productive in the way the two knock together, which hopefully you will agree with me when I'm done talking. Um, so I think in recent years, right, group instruction in libraries has been organized by and around the ACRL Information Literacy Competency Standards. The set of performance indicators and measurable outcomes first adopted in 2000 and then recently revised and then joined in constellation by the Framework for Information Literacy has structured the way many of our information literacy programs are organized, delivered, and assessed. The standards have, have productively enabled us to define for ourselves a teaching location within the academy. 
Academic librarians define and take pedagogical responsibility for information learn literacy, learning outcomes, and their assessment. The standards accompanied significant growth in our role as teachers, and I think one could argue that they have been central to the consolidation of a teaching identity for many of us. I know they have been for me. Because I entered the field in 2002 and librarianship, like American culture probably has, now I'm like thinking in my head about other cultures that are different. I'm gonna try to stay with the talk, but I think librarianship in the United States has a very short memory, very short historical memory. So I think that the standards have seemed to be what information literacy is to librarians of my generation. I have mapped more curricula to the learning outcomes in that document than I care to remember. I have designed more testing questions than I ever wanted to using the performance indicators in the standards. And like any professional document emanating from a center of power, and I think ACRL is one of those centers of power, the standards have also produced significant critique. So that by 2010, John Bushman could argue that the opposition to the standards was a significant portion of the theoretical voice of IL thinking. So as much as you had people talking about information literacy, you had them talking against information literacy as it was conceived. So you have the both of those discourses sort of rising together. So people thought and wrote about the standards, and then they thought and wrote about against them, and the two of them together form sort of what we understand as information literacy. Christine Polly has offered what to me has been the dominant in image of critical engagement with standards-based teaching, the Procrustean bed. Do you guys know this image? Do you know the story of Procrustes? Yeah, okay, I see some nods. He's a figure from Greek mythology, and he lived along the route from Athens to Eleusis. It's pronounced Eleusis. If you Google it, there's a nice YouTube, Eleusis. Uh, he would invite pilgrims traveling this sacred road to stay the night, and while they were sleeping, he would cut and stretch their bodies to fit his bed precisely. Pretty gruesome, right? Uh, so Polly locates a troubling Procrustean paradigm in information literacy work that's rooted in standards, one that forces the varied forms of information production, seeking, and use into an atomized set of mechanistic requirements disconnected from the concrete practice of particular students producing, seeking, and using information in everyday academic life. Maura Seal has extended Polly's critique, arguing that the standards fix in place definitions of information, literacy, and student that foreclose learning that might contest or upend any of those three things, like what we think information is, what we think literacy is, and what we think students are. James Elmborg has argued that the standards reify hierarchies of knowledge production, posi positioning students as consumers of information produced by other people, experts who know things, the, by other people who are experts who know things that students are then required to learn. For Polly, Seal, Elborg, and others, standards are inextricable from banking education because they define in advance in rather narrow ways what matters in teaching and learning. Standards are necessarily mechanistic and rote. So my argument here is that it's like built into the standards pro project. So we could critique the, what's inside the standards and revise it and put different things in there, but the fact that it functions as a standard, that structure, is sort of what is problematic. And we see similar arguments in K through 12 education where standards and testing are the norm. So right, like I have an eight year old, he's taking common core math. Lots and lots of people hate common core, right? I don't understand it. I think people hate it because they're like, I don't, I don't get it and it makes me feel kind of, I feel bad that I don't understand second grade math. And I'm lucky that my girlfriend understands second grade math and you know, we're blessed as a family for that. But there's not a problem, essentially, with the way that numeracy is conceived. The problem is its attachment to a testing regime, right? It's the problem is its attachment to power and that people lose jobs and that produces an environment where it isn't just about helping Oscar with his number sense, which is amazing because of Common Core, right, actually. We can talk, I, there's another talk, right? <laughs> we could have another time. But the, the problem is the testing regime that he'll be subject to and that his teachers will be subject to. Like I have a friend who is a librarian in a private school and she's always talking about how great the Common Core is. Like Common Core is terrific for the way it conceives learning because you don't have to test in private school. So I think because standards cannot, because they're standards, capture the messy, iterative, long time scale nature of learning, they can't help but enact a mechanistic fantasy, one that inevitably leads to testing and reporting in order to ensure that various programs are up to snuff. So I'd like to note here a tension I see between a critique of standards-based approaches to information literacy and what I think we could argue are the indisputable material effects that the standards with a capital S have had on many of our libraries and instruction programs. 
The standards have helped many of us make our case as central to teaching and learning in higher education, both inside the university and to external stakeholders. In the data-driven context in which many of us do our work, the clarity and specificity that we challenge in the standards has also facilitated data collection and reporting and have helped us to articulate our value so that we can get funding for things that all of us want. Classrooms, computers, projectors, and yes, more librarians. But the standards have done this work along an instrumental axis of external outcomes that many of us argue are disconnected from the local information needs of particular groups of students. And that's in the nature of a standard. Some level of abstraction from the local is built into that project. Even when my focus is on accounting for the local, the existence of the standards compels me to map what I do every day to that standardizing global. And each time I do that work, I invest more power in the standards. I make them more real. They begin to govern my, way, my work in ways that I don't think I can even see, turning the classroom space that could play host to something magical into, it turns it into a sort of instrumentalist domain of reporting and compliance. That sounds very grim and maybe it doesn't ring true for you, but I think for, for me, um, I'm always fighting against that impulse. So this I think is the conundrum. How can we do critical work in, in a standards driven higher education environment? Is that work even possible? I think the framework for information literacy for higher education offers an example of an attempt to write and think a way out of compliance culture in, in information literacy context. It represents an incorporation of many cr of the critical perspectives in the field and has been welcomed by many as a document that gets us out of the prescriptivist problem with the standards. It represents an intervention, I think, in the kairos of compliance. It's an effort to create a different kind of future. So I'd like to turn next to the work that the framework does and doesn't do to address the conundrum of critical pedagogy in a time of compliance. That's my next slide. Also has some bullet points, pretty proud of it. All right. So the framework, as we all know, was developed initially as part of the cyclical revision process for the Standards for Information Literacy. The group assembled to revise the standards did not produce what many of us expected them to, or at least I expected them to, which was small changes and alterations to a document whose bones would be left fundamentally intact. Instead, the framework represents a sea change in the professional association's approach to information literacy, one that in many ways explicitly rejects the standards while incorporating much of the decade of critique that grew up alongside them. It's really weird to read a professional document and see yourself represented, right, for me. I see the framework as an institutional effort to intervene in compliance cultures that produced and are produced by the fixed and functional outcomes and indicators in the standards document. The, st the framework is self-evident in its rejection of compliance culture, I think. It lays claim to richer, more complex ideas. It notes that it is called a framework intentionally because it is based on a cluster of in interconnected core concepts with flexible options for implementation rather than on a set of standards or learning outcomes or any prescriptive enumeration of skills. In its description of its warrant, the framework explicitly rejects the procrustean bed of compliance-based teaching and learning and resists the prescriptivism of standards. The document does include knowledge practices and dispositions that some have noted operate in the same way that the outcomes and indicators of the standards do. But I think the framework anticipates this critique, arguing that neither the knowledge practices nor the dispositions that support each concept are intended to prescribe what local institutions should do in using the framework. Each library and its partners on campus will need to deploy these frames to best fit their own situation, including designing learning outcomes. For the same reason, these lists should not be considered exhaustive. Right? So even as it gives you those in, you know, measurable things, it says this is not all of them and you don't have to use them. So I think of that as a disavowal, and there's, like another, there's another talk in there about like what it means to disavow the power that you have to determine the behavior of all the librarians who are then, because how many of us were asked to redesign something be, to met, meet the framework. How many of you were asked to redesign something? Only a couple of us? Okay, a few of us, all right, a handful. I have to when I get back to my office. Um, I'm gonna stay right here in Illinois. I'm just gonna sit, I'm gonna sit at this podium the whole time. Um, so, the, But I think that, that insistence on, cont on a contextual articulation of information literacy pedagogy addresses, quite frankly, that last critique of the standards, right, that they are, um, that we have to make everybody, we have to cut everybody to fit. As it distances from itself from the prescriptivism of the standards, the framework tells us again and again that it is not interested in telling us what to do. 
It is, I think, however, interested in telling us a little something about what to think about. And much of what it wants us to think about emerges from a critical perspective. And these, I'm going to use these three frames as examples of that. So the first one, authority is constructed and contextual. One of the main issues that critical librarians have had with the standards is the way the document constructs information as a thing separable from the social and political dynamics that produce it and inform its reception. The standards don't make clear the ways that context produce things like authority. So when I teach students about authority, we always discuss the ways context inform that analysis. What's more authoritative about Pokemon, for example, something we find in a scholarly journal uh, or Bulbapedia? Have you guys looked at that? We used it for Oscar's Halloween costume a couple Halloweens ago. Um, but it's like fan stuff is super comprehensive on the internet in wikis, right? That's where the authority is. So authority always relies on who is in a position to know, what constructs what it's possible for an author to know, and to whom the author is speaking. Authority has a rhetorical dimension. And of course, we can teach this in an information literacy classroom governed by the standards. I think a lot of us have. But the framework makes explicit this critical perspective. The framework asks, invites us to ask about the dynamics of scholarly knowledge production. Who gets to have access to the academy in the first place? What kinds of ideas get stopped by the gatekeeping of peer reviewers? My favorite for that is I, um, example of that is something that I submitted to a journal and the, the reviewer comments came back. This article would be improved if the conceptual framework was removed. <laughs> I was like, well, that's going to be hard because the article is proposing a conceptual framework, right? So it was like, I don't know what's there. But like getting past the gatekeeping that, that says what matters and counts as scholarship, um, I think is significant, right? Uh, the rather conservative, when you think about it, demand that scholarly resources build on what is already known through paradigms that only rarely change, right? You have to have a lit review. You have to cite a certain number of things. So in the case where I have this article sent back to me because of the conceptual framework that's so frustrating and annoying, who wants that? The reviewer wanted to reject my thinking because it was insufficiently empirical. It wasn't authoritative according to his sense of what counts as authority. So the framework in this first frame is explicit about the socially constructed nature of authority. It argues that information literacy includes the ability to, quote, acknowledge biases that privilege some sources of authority over others, especially in terms of others' worldviews, gender, sexual orientation, and cultural orientations. As a governing document, the framework effectively places at the center of professional discourse an idea of authority rooted in context, as contested and subject to contestation by our students. For me, this is a profoundly critical move. I also see a, a lot of critical work being done in the information has value frame. This frame directly engages with the political economy of information production. And if you had told me 10 years ago that the professional association would want to directly engage with the political economy of information production in a way that I think is informed by Marx, I'd be like, are you out of your mind, you know? So as a Marxist myself, I never thought I would see the day when the document would would talk about the commodification of information, that that would be something that wouldn't happen on the side, but would be at the center. I think even less likely is a professional document that addresses the cultural specificity of that commodification and the suggestion that the world could be otherwise. So if you read that frame, it notes that intellectual property is a legal and social construct that varies by culture, right? It doesn't have to be the, you know, we could imagine another world where information didn't function this way. An acknowledgement of variation and contingency, I think, is something that critical librarians have long argued for, as is the implicit claim here that capitalist ideas of property are not natural or eternal. To see this idea move to the professional discourse, I think, is really something new. This frame also emphasizes the role students play as creators of information. Those agents of social change I discussed above, the framework casts them as such. It names them that way that way. It says that information literate students are contributors to the information marketplace rather than only consumers of it. Not only is the student entitled to contribute, she is also responsible for deciding where and how their information is published. So I see here the way the framework connects with ongoing conversations about the political economy of information production and circulation writ large. The framework invites us to invite students into our work around open access publishing and open educational resources. Again, the standards didn't mean that we couldn't talk about these things, but the framework tells us that we ought to. For me, the most compelling direct engagement with critical ideas in the framework is the fifth frame, scholarship as conversation. Reading Barbara Pfister on research as rhetoric from the 1980s is a touchstone for my own critical praxis. The way she approaches information as rhetorical 
as having meaning that is always constructed in dialogue, helped me begin to articulate for myself an understanding of information literacy that resisted the reification of information literacy and student that I think Maura Seal talks about, and instead kept all three in motion as sites of analysis, criticism, and debate. Right, so it only has meaning in the moment we're engaging it. To me, that was revelatory. So I see this at the heart, as the heart of critical pedagogy and resistance to compliance culture. So to see it emerge in a key document from my professional body has been remarkable. So I think it's worth quoting the first part in length, at some length, which now I'm looking at it, I'm like, that could, totally could have been another slide. Right? I could have the quote up here and then read it aloud, right? <laughs> but instead I'm gonna read it aloud without the, the PowerPoint slide. Um, it's like an experiment. Uh, research in scholarly and professional fields is a discursive practice in which ideas are formulated, debated, and weighed against one another over extended periods of time. Instead of seeking discrete answers to complex problems, experts understand that a given issue may be characterized by several competing perspectives as part of an ongoing conversation in which information users and creators come together and negotiate meaning. Experts understand that while some topics have established answers through this process, a query may not have a single uncontested answer. So for me, the idea that none of this is fixed, that it's all in a conversation is a pretty radical move. I also read it and I'm like, experts? Let's unpack experts, right? But that's the joy and pleasure of being a scholar, right, in this field, is that we could spend another talk about what the expert is in this framework. So while this frame is ostensibly about defining a way of thinking about scholarship, I also see it as a direct confrontation of a compliance culture that seeks metrics, data, and measurement that can't help but be about finding the correct answer, right? We do those measurements and then we report and it's the truth, right? So what this frame tells us is that there is no there is no meaning, there is no fixed truth except insofar that a thing is in motion as part of a discussion or a conversation. If scholarship is a conversation, so is information literacy itself, so is all the data that we produce, and the framework offers in this fifth frame a powerful oppositional voice to the compliance mode that is produced and reproduced by the standards. So now I wanna talk a little bit about why I'm not, why that doesn't get me so excited, right? Or why there's like a, like I'm excited obviously, but then there's also something that puts a damper on that for me. So given the way that the framework aligns with many of the ways that I think about information literacy, given the extent of my own critique of standards-based teaching and learning, why am I not more excited? In part, it's because as soon as I'm done with this talk, right, like that minute, I have to go and check my email, I brought my phone and my laptop to ensure that all edits to the test bank questions have been completed so that we can begin validity testing as soon as the semester is over. Because as soon as the framework debuted, we got news of a standardized test that we could purchase to help us measure and report whether our students had crossed various thresholds. Because librarians, including me, instantly began trying to make crosswalks between the standards and the framework so that we, we could continue to use our same assessment plans rather than having to start from scratch. Because the framework is a part of the story, but not the entire story of the moment in which we find ourselves. The framework has power to shape our conversations, but it does not have all the power. The compliance culture has some, even a lot of power too. And the framework is itself a product of a time of compliance. As much as I love the way it centers critical perspectives in the field, I also see traces of the demand for outcomes that are easily measured. Rather than providing us with only big concepts with which to grapple as teachers and scholars, the framework offers knowledge practices and dispositions that to me when I read them feel every bit as fixed and measurable as the outcomes and indicators in the standards. The framework attempts to shift the kairos away from data gathering and compliance, but it can't get totally out from under those things, right? We need to pass our accreditation review. Academic librarians don't live simply in the realm of critique. We also require tools that can help us meet institutional demands for data. And it is, it is, I think, part of the task of our professional association to help us develop those tools. The framework tells a story about itself that sets it apart from the structural and institutional forces that produce the standards. The story casts the framework as the product of an exceptional present that is rapidly changing and dynamic and often uncertain, requiring a richer, more complex set of core ideas. And I read that right and I'm like, oh, tell it to Detroit in the 1920s, right? <laughs> like it's, every moment is like that, every moment is changing. So I think even as the framework sets itself apart from the fixed and mechanistic approach of the standards, it still fixes things. The frames, for example, and the foundational ideas. And I see this anxiety produced in part by the effort to straddle two impulses, the desire to center the concerns of critical pedagogy and the need to help librarians meet the demands of this time of compliance. 
The framework is a centralized consensus document that emerges from our professional center. It transforms intellectual work meant to promote reflection about the philosophy and practice of teaching into a codified set of foundational ideas. And while local information literacy learning outcomes are meant to be locally developed, the framework defines, even we could say standardizes, the big ideas against which we should develop them. I happen to find the articulation of information as a commodity under capitalism to be compelling and true. You might not. The universalizing and standardizing that even the framework does is, I think, a structural effect of being a document codified as part of the professional constellation of, docu of documents in a higher education environment that demands the measurable, the reportable, the quantifiable. I don't know that this, effort can, this effect can be sidestepped simply by claiming to be outside of standards making, by denying one's own prescriptivism. So what do we do? I want to end this talk by restating the conundrum in which I find myself and in which some of you may find yourselves, and I hope this has been resonant today. On the one hand, I am excited about the promise of critical pedagogy. It enlivens my thinking and my practice. Spending my time imagining, discussing, and then trying out ways of teaching that help my students understand the political economy of information production is a really fun job, right? I think I was kind of born to do it. It's great. I love it. On the other hand, I know that data gathering, analysis, and reporting are really important parts of my job, too. In fact, sometimes they actually offer insight that I wouldn't get just from my spidey sense of how students are learning in my classrooms. And I know that my capacity to engage in quantifying program level learning outcomes that are linked to standards in the profession means a lot for the kinds of resources that I am able to mobilize within the university for myself, my colleagues, and our students. So in this talk, what I've done is drawn from my own experiences and used them as a springboard for thinking about what the implications are of trying to teach critically while also trying to comply with assessment demands. Every time I deploy an assessment measure, I worry that it means I believe in it that I will become the kind of teacher who relies on banking methods because they help me gain access to institutional resources. I'm wondering if this sounds familiar to you and if any of you are ever coming up against an assessment regime that feels like an awkward fit for your goals in the library classroom. How in your classrooms are you dealing with the kinds of standards and assessment protocols you are asked to engage inside your institution? And if this isn't something that you're asked to do, I wonder if you still feel those tensions coming from within the profession itself. So with the time we have left, I'd like us to take some time to think about these questions and invite you to talk about them with me. So this is sort of my question for the room that I'd like you to spend some time uh, thinking about and maybe ask me about at the mic. And so that's what I have to share with you this morning. Thank you. So we have microphones. If there's questions or comments, raise your hand and we will come to you. And this is like new thinking. As I was putting it together, putting the talk together, I was like, oh, am I the only person who feels this tension, feels this pressure? So if you don't have a question for me, I would love to hear how you're feeling it or how that's manifesting in your own sort of library. No, Emily, you're not alone. I'm not alone, thank you. <laughs> So I went to an information literacy event last week, a little workshop in Ohio, and um, felt a little frustrated because the tension is there for me as well. I teach an information technology class, and I don't feel that the framework addresses all the, what I stumbled upon is a theory called new literacies. And so, um, as much as the critical pedagogy is there, it, terms like information and scholarship, I feel, are a little old-fashioned. And so um, that's where the tension lies for me. So the framework doesn't capture the way that you're seeing information at work in your own, yeah. Right. Information age, where's the technology mentioned? Interesting. Right? Yeah. Oh, I was going to say it gets worse. Um, I'm from uh, uh, University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, um, and we, if you didn't know, have been under attack by our government for almost five years now. Um, and so, assessment for us is a um, interesting um, thing. Uh, we, I think that in situations like that, you develop a hyper compliance 
like an overcompliance with assessment um, because there are so many groups or constituents that you're trying to convince. It's not just about getting resources. It's about getting HLC, which is our accreditor, to say something to the legislature or, you know, the legislature could care less about our assessment. But um, so, I mean, it was interesting to me to listen to this and think about um, the ways in which we have become uh, sort of complicit in our own over, like our own, our compensation for this and like how, you know, how do you get out of that? Um, that sort of uh, over compliance, so. Yeah, I mean, I think the stakes are really high, right? Because like, if you don't comply, you lose your job, right? Like it's, there are material effects to that. So one of the things that I liked about the standards was that I didn't have to think very hard about my compliance, right? Like I could just sort of use the tools that were developed by my professional body, get that out of the way, and then go about doing my other things that I'm sort of more interested in doing, right? Um, and so the framework's demand to develop local outcomes, while it fits with my ideology, it doesn't fit that well with my like material day-to-day -day practice. Where like, I, I you know I don't have I don't have time to do that. Like if I have to do that, that means I'm not doing a bunch of other things. And at the end of the day, whatever I develop locally has to fit into my assessment regime, right? Which really it's not it's not it's, it, like it doesn't want a narrative. Right, like the, the, we're getting new accreditation standards from middle states um, in our region that uh, are very explicit about that. They say no more narrative, we only want data. And so I think the frames enable us to make kinds of narratives about what our students are doing in the classroom and how we're teaching, which is great for me in my true heart of hearts. But when I, when I get to the level where I have to report at the end of the year, it's like it, it, it has to be translated into those demands. Hi, Lisa. Hey, um, Lisa Hinchliff, University of Illinois. Obviously engaged a lot with the framework process when it was being developed. So I'm wondering if you also have any thoughts about the degree to which the, um, what is definitely downplayed in the final version, but was very prominent in the drafts, which was the threshold concepts, are themselves um, part of what is challenging for us in the framework. Because one of the things I find so interesting is that this document, which everyone has definitely found pedagogical creativity in has not generated other frames like I, I've given one talk with one other person where we've proposed two other frames but for such freedom I, I'm not seeing a thousand frames blooming across our profession so what is it in this freedom that we aren't taking and part of that threshold concepts or is part of that the assessment regime or where would you place that yeah, I mean, I don't know. I know as much about that as anybody in the room knows about that, right? Like, why are you not developing new frames, right? Like, I'm not doing it because I'm doing other things. And I think part of the tension that I feel with the, with the framework is that it's, it, tell, it, it invites me to think a lot about things that I already think a lot about. Like, it actually really aligns with sort of how I think about teaching and learning. Um, I'm under no fantasy that everybody's like me. Right? I assume that people think differently from me, right? And so I think a lot of people are simply choosing not to think about threshold concepts because they want to think about they don't want to think about threshold concepts, which, you know, I think is, you know, fine, right? So I don't know that there needs to be a generation of more frames. Um, it's been interesting to me. So I'm I'm wor this this talk and sort of my thinking that's all pretty provisional at this point is. I want to write a book about standards, right? And what standards do and how they produce and organize power within a profession like ours. So I've been looking at a lot of the different standards. It's very interesting to me that we have talked a lot about the framework. We talk a lot about the standards, but there's a current revision happening. You know, and I'm not, I'm not close enough to where these discussions happen, but there's a current revision happening for like the standards of information literacy programs, like overall, I think. I don't know, I saw a blog post about it. Um, Guidelines, okay, so there's a revision to these guidelines and what I'm not hearing is a lot of like feelings coming out um, around that revision process. So there's something about the way that the standards are about, um, I think stuff that we all know really matters to us about teaching and learning that um, activated us around this. And I think, you know, people wanna do things other than shore up the professional centralized document. You know, I wanna do other things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I'm, thank you very much for your talk. A lot of the points that you make really resonate with me. As someone who 
um, was going through the process of mapping an entire college's curriculum, like like or information literacy to the yeah. college's curriculum for each department as these talks were going on when we were developing the framework and then afterwards thinking, okay, what now? Yeah. <laughs> um, this has been really helpful and I'm wondering, I, I'm curious what you, what you think about how um, our anxieties as a profession, as like establishing professionalism, um, how that relates to this. So, you know, we were sort of anxious about our status on campuses, especially as academic librarians. Um, you know, these standards kind of provide legitimacy in mm -hmm. establishing, like we're serious about this. This is why you should value us. And, and I think in a, in a time that a lot of us are, um, have either already given up tenure or that you know that's that's a struggle or um, I'm curious about how those anxieties about us as a profession tie into our trying to establish these these standards that um, legitimize our work I guess yeah I mean I think that plays a huge a huge role you know and again like I'm not a standards maker and I know that there are people in this room like Lisa and others who are standards makers and Troy and you know so like in terms of what people are thinking in the process of generating those documents I don't know but I do think that you can see um, and I'm, I'm spacing on her name but I'll remember it and and we'll connect but it's um, she wrote a great history of information literacy of the standards project, right, that talks about how the standards emerge at a time when there's all this reform happening in higher ed um, after the Spellings Commission report, is that it? Yeah, after the Spellings Commission report. It's really good to have a historian in the family. Spellings Commission, she's like, yeah. Um, but those conversations were happening and librarians weren't really at the table. And so if I'm in higher ed and I'm not at the table, then I don't get to make an argument for my centrality. And I think those are all material fights, right? That means that I don't get a classroom, I don't get computers, I don't get a projector, I don't get to hire you know, me to work there. So um, the information literacy standards as a kind of platform for making an argument to other outside people about um, how you're a part of the university also. Um, I think they play a, a really significant function in that conversation. Like now I have a platform, the information literacy standards, that I can then use to talk to other standards generating bodies, my accreditor, um, the federal government, right? Uh, other, um, I do a lot of assessment work on my campus and I was talking to my, our assessment representative just yesterday, right? And she was, or I guess that was Wednesday, it's Friday. It was on Wednesday and she was talking about how uh, the middle state standards are now having to talk to the education standards and the accrediting body from the School of Health Professions and all of these things sort of coming together. And so if you don't have a standards document, I don't think you get to enter into the conversations where people with standards documents are talking. And I think that's really in, like critical, important work that the standards have done. So like I love critiquing text right? Like that's my favorite thing to do in the world. And so I love to look at the standards and sort of pick them apart. And you know, next I'll look at the framework and sort of pick it apart. But at the end of the day, I think the document itself, no matter what's inside of it, has material effects on all of us. I think it's why I have a job, frankly, and I love my job. So I'm grateful. Yeah. I think, and I think we, I would love for more conversation to be about st the structural effects of these things. Because I think that's a conversation I don't hear happening that I think if we could grapple with it, we could maybe make some a different kind of world. I don't know. I think you've asked a fundamental question. How does this shape your practice? Because uh, critical information literacy, critical pedagogy, critical theory, and others have informed my practice for some years now. And that's where I think the transition from standards to a framework is important, is that we are all, as librarians and even academics, socialized to teach a certain way and to view information and education a certain way. Most of it is coming from a Western perspective. And where I've had my eyes open is looking at transformative learning, critical race theory, and many others, uh, because critical pedagogy is informed by others as well. Yeah. Broadening that perspective and looking at students in the context of their lives, and also from a cultural and social perspective, is that information knowledge just doesn't come from out of the blue, is that there is that context, it is produced that way, and all of us have that inscribed in us. And so I, what I see is that the mental process of seeing what the framework can do as opposed to standards is that it's not really an either or. Um, now in terms of trying to develop specific standards out of the framework is something totally different. I haven't figured that out. But for me the important part is getting to that place 
where philosophically I'm looking at it very differently, at information and teaching and learning very differently. And you really have to get outside of um, the library profession and look at other philosophies and th learning theories to really understand uh, uh, all of these different factors that go into it. I have a question for you. Do you feel like the framework was instrumental in you coming to that? Or did no, that happen I, outside of the... Uh, no, I was introduced to this yeah. uh, 10 years ago. Um, Troy was one of the first authors that I read. That, yeah, me too. And, and Elmberg. So yeah. I've been at this for about 10 years now. So uh, that's why I've already, I think, had that transformation already. So for me, it's very easy to look at. But what I see is that I work with a lot of faculty who have been in the field 30 years or so. And the way they teach is that old time lecture. That's the way they were socialized. They can't envision another way of teaching. Librarians too. Um, my generation and older generations, we were taught to teach a certain way. I was taught under the old bibliographic instruction. But if you look at real teaching and learning and engaging with students, it's completely different. It's so interesting, right? So I'm staying at the Spring Hill Suites. Is, are other people at the Spring Hill Suites? So did you see that card in your room that was like, come down and grab a bite and a drink and join the lively action in the lobby, right? <laughs> and I was like, I looked at the card and I was like, oh, if there's a free happy hour, like I'm in. But then I looked at the card a little closer and I was like, it doesn't give an hour or a time, right? It doesn't give a play, like, so it's not happy hour. It is, they are inviting us via this card to produce a thing, right? The, to come down and join the lively conversation. And like, I guarantee you, I'm not gonna see you later in the lobby grabbing a nosh from the, you know? So like, it's a fantasy, I think, that the card can then produce a world where we are all gathering in convivial ways in the lobby, noshing and drinking a beer from the hotel lobby. Like, that's not how people use hotels. And so that's probably not gonna happen with, you know, like we all put up signs that are ignored all the time. So like we as a field should know better than anyone that like having a, having a, a table tent is not producing the thing, right? So that my interest is, like I'm interested in, like somebody do a longitudinal study, it's not gonna be me, of like how many librarians actually had their practice transformed by the framework document. Because I, I think you're right that it centers, like obviously I think I agree with you that I think it centers a lot of critical perspectives, but is that enough to change the sort of attitudes, practices, behaviors of librarians who didn't come to teaching with those ideas already? You know? But you know, now we have to join each other in the lobby, you know, <laughs> and take a selfie, you know, <laughs> after we've worked. Anyway. So another thing that I guess I'd love to hear your thoughts on is the way that um, though the framework asserts itself as not a standard, um, just like standards don't have to be used as standards, right? They can be used as guidelines that we adapt and create. The framework itself, from what I can see, is actually being used quite as a standard across a lot of things. And so why are we also driven to replicate that standardness in not you personally, but collectively, if w the freedom we, f the, the very freedom that the document is giving us, I guess I keep coming back to this question of why are we so afraid to take that freedom collectively? Well, I think because we're not, we're not like, born anew fresh each day in a brand new world that we create on our own right like we 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 live in higher education now right so i'm reproducing and i totally am going to reproduce the framework as a standard because that's the world that i live in right so i I'm, i am interested in the way that the framework um, disavows its power as a standard right i think that if you are a document that comes from the center of professional power in academic librarianship you're going to function as a standard and i think people are going to measure their work against what you told them to measure because i think that's just like i think structurally functionally that's how it works and i don't think you could write your way out of that so that's part of the claim um, that I, or the part of the argument that i'm making um, so i think it's totally natural it's under, not natural nothing's natural but it's it our behavior, our, the way we're engaging it is constructed by the lives that we're living today, which are about, like my assessment report is due May 31st, you know, <laughs> or May 30th, I guess. Um, and then there's another one due November 30th. I mean, it's just relentless, right? So uh, that's why I don't take my own freedom, you know, or I take it in other places, right? In other spaces. Like, um, there's a chapter in the Critical Pedagogy book by Kathy Eisenhower and Dulcie Smith called uh, Critical Librarianship in a Stuck Place, I think, and it's, makes exactly this point that you have 
that you have things like standards and they produce for you the classroom that you get to stand in. And once you're in the classroom, you get to do, kind of do whatever you want, right? But you, you have to sort of live within the systems of power that you find yourself in order to make the case that you get to that classroom, right? And how many of us have lost a classroom in our information literacy labs in the last five years that my colleagues at the post campus lost all of theirs, right? So it's like, it's a big deal. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> sorry. Hi, Emily. Uh, I want to see if you could give us uh, a few thoughts on the tension, not between critical pedagogy and assessment, but between critical pedagogy, critical information literacy, and the new framework. I think you alluded to it uh, a little bit, that we really, those of us that uh, think in terms of critical information literacy, we got a lot of the things that we wanted uh, with, the, with the new framework. Uh, it's not perfect, but we got a lot of it. Uh, but critical pedagogy tells us that uh, as soon as it becomes uh, uh, the, the dominant power structure uh, of our national body, that we need to tear it apart again, and we need to we need to take it apart. We need to think about it. So there is, um, uh, I think, there's a tension there, and maybe Lisa alluded to it that uh, we have a framework, and uh, it was actually kind of supposed to be open-ended uh, that we could generate more frames than those that existed. But once it became set in place, we've not really seen a lot of those. So the, this is a tension that I'm interested in. Uh, interested to hear what you what you might think. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't like I don't because I'm not close enough to the process I don't really know how it works like if I come up with a new frame how does it get in the framework does anybody know like I would I would probably call Troy right and ask him to tell me what to do right so I you know I don't know so uh, having been enough. alluded to earlier before as a standards maker and also by the way had the uh, actually the president who charged the task force to decide whether there would be a revision to the standards that then created the standards revision task force that wrote the framework. So my fault, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so two things. One is um, the document itself uh, is under a CCB SA. So you can write your own framework according to ACRL. So that's one way. But the second thing is the framework, just like every other ACRL standards, guidelines, and frameworks now document, will come up for review every five years because that's the way a professional association legitimizes its documents. <laughs> so right. in, in five years, there'll be a task force to decide whether or not to review and revise the framework, at which point presumably one will get charged, at which point you could probably submit your comments, go to a hearing, all those sorts of things. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 like this has been an issue for since Plato, right? When he was like, don't, if, once you write things down, like the, you know, everything is, you, you know, it's fixed and it can't be in dialogue, right? So I think once the framework is like fixed on the website, like just because the way humans work, it kind of will stay there. But with the revision process, it sounds like that's the way to get in. I do think there's something interesting to unpack in the figure of the expert in the framework. Like that's the tension that I see with critical pedagogy is the way that the expert is sort of mobilized in that document I think is potentially interesting. Hi, Alana Stonebreaker, Purdue University. Um, I, so I was thinking about this and I was thinking about how we as librarians and our, as in, I'm an instruction librarian, so um, are, are sort of shaped as well by the standards, right? We have, my job description includes that I'm supposed to do this transformative teaching, right? Uh, that is supposed to be very helpful. Um, but uh, so like, what, what do you think is that has, needs to change about us as much as what needs to change about the framework? Because we talk a lot about what the framework, it's kind of like a, everything we love, like that kicks commercial, everything we love, none of the things we don't. Like yeah. it's got all sorts of different things in it that we like and we always talk about how to, how to do it, but what needs to change in the profession to become more what the framework had hoped for us? I think it helps to acknowledge that there is a structural role that standards play, right? And to talk more about that. Now, obviously, I'm saying, like, we should talk more about my ideas, right? <laughs> so, like, that would help. But I do think, like, if you, um, if you see, if, you, if we could see the professional document as doing constructive work for us as a profession without having to sink into whether or not it's telling us the right things to do, right? So the same way that we're nimble enough that when somebody calls me, like, a couple weeks ago, a, a professor emailed me at 9.30 and said, do you have anyone who can teach at 10.30, right? 
And I was like, no, I don't. Except that one of my colleagues was like, yeah, I'm totally around. I'll totally do it. And she hopped right in, right? So like we're nimble and agile and we can sort of respond pretty quickly, I think, to those kinds of things. And so I think we should have the same sort of like nimble, agile response to changes in strategic documents, right? That we should be like, oh, so this strategic document means I need to do this, this thing that I'm doing for reasons that are not about my soul, right? But are about my job and sort of not invest them with as much value as I think that we sometimes do. Because if the framework's really going to be revised and I'm going to have five new frames in five years, I don't want to I don't, I don't want to get too attached, right? And so I think, I think that would help as a profession. Not looking for truth in things that aren't truth-telling devices, which I think are professional standardizing documents. They don't tell the truth. That's not their job. They're written by consensus, right? I'm coming. Um, hi. Um, one thing that I've thought a lot about since this framework came out, and because at first, you know, I was very excited. I thought, oh, you know, we're going to be putting all these great ideas into this professional document. And then I started, after it came out, I started thinking, well, that, is that what we needed from a professional document? <laughs> um, so right. I, mean, I think that's kind of what you were just getting at, is that we now codified all this, this, this stuff that by definition maybe shouldn't be codified. Um, isn't that what, you know, the kind of essence of critical like pedagogy and critical literacy is is changing its its um, environment specific. It's you know, and so, and we do what we you know, but we also have this constant tension with trying to um, prove ourselves and and you know on in this compliance issue, and it isn't it maybe what we really need from a professional um, association is the compliance part, because we have to have some. We can't just we cannot create the standards. We can, but they don't have as much weight. If my university c creates this and then your university creates that, then we don't have that professional weight behind us. And maybe it should, maybe the f it should be flipped. Maybe the, the framework should come from your institution and the, and the, the standards come from the profession. Um, that's not a, it's not a criticism of the framework. It's, it's just all of a sudden this kind of question arose, I feel like, of, well, wait a minute, maybe, was that the right path <laughs> to take? Was that the most effective use of the professional association document? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you, right? So like in a super concrete way, we just got a remodel in our library that added, I don't know, 11 billion seats. And we got that because the standard says you need to have a certain number of seats per FTE. And so our dean was able to say, look, we're not meeting the standard number of seats. You need to give me enough money to add enough seats to our library so that we have enough seats. And now we have enough seats. So that's like the kind of material change that I think can be affected by a standards document. So that's really concrete. I think it's a little, like the ties are a little harder to make with information literacy. But yeah, to me, I read it and I'm like, well, why didn't you codify my idea, right? Like, why, why don't we say that all, all programs have to have a, frame, a, a queer Marxist framework for information literacy? And we don't, because like, I don't get to decide, right? Like, and I don't think the information, I, I don't think the professional body gets to decide how I spend my intellectual time. So I agree with you. I think. The framework, uh, like clearly I, I like it and I like engaging the ideas in it. And I think as ideas, they, like if it was, if it was part of the work of scholarship, I think it, I would be more excited about it and s rather than the work of, the sta of standardizing. Yeah, so I agree with you. It's 1039, you guys. Yeah, so I think we're at a good point to cut off questions. So how about another round of applause? Thank you, everyone, thanks. Don't run away, don't run away. I, like, I haven't stared at my phone for like an hour. It's very stressful. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jill King from DePaul University and uh, an organizer of this year's summit. I'd like to thank Emily for joining us um, and sharing this really engaging and informative talk, um, both with us here in Illinois and online as well. And we have a small um, token of our appreciation to present oh, to you. Thank you. Is this a small it's and delicious candy. So. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.